Hello, my name is Natalie Kylander. I'm a managing director at the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation. And on behalf of the Nudge Foundation, it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you to this fireside chat uh, with Don Gibbs, who's the CEO of the Skoll Foundation, and Raj Shah, uh, president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, at DRK, we work to support social entrepreneurs addressing important problems and help them to scale their impact. We're grateful to have had the opportunity to support the Nudge Foundation in the early days, and it's my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce you to two incredible partners and leaders, Don Gibbs and Raj Shah. Don is the CEO of the Skoll Foundation, where he leads the organization's work, investing in, connecting, and celebrating change leaders who are driving lasting social change around the world. His experience spans public service, politics, business, finance and technology. Raj serves as the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, a global institution with a mission to promote the well-being of humanity around the world. Under his leadership, the foundation applies data science and innovation to improve health for women and children, create nutritious and sustainable food systems, and end energy poverty for more than a billion people worldwide and enable meaningful economic mobility in the United States and around the world. The overall theme I'd like to draw on today is that of collaboration, collaboration across organizations and sectors, and the coming together of a variety of partners to really drive social change in India. This includes diaspora and allies from across the world and also stakeholders from governments, business, and civil society. So my first question to both of you, Raj and Don, it's such an honor to be here with you today at this global convening of some of the biggest believers in collaborative action. And both Rockefeller Foundation and Skoll have amazing track records, but COVID is all we read or we hear about or we talk about. And I'd like to ask you, what are your respective organizations doing to fight the pandemic? And how do these actions fit in with your respective commitments to solve problems without borders? Don, let me start with you. Uh, glad to start and uh, just such an honor to be here with Raj, who's a dear old friend and somebody that we're, <coughs> we're incredibly excited to be working with and with DRK and with Nudge, all of whom are such great examples of how to work collaboratively um, and for Skoll, this is quite a moment. Uh, for those of you who don't know Jeff Skoll, our founder, uh, he really has been a platform builder his whole career. Uh, started with eBay. When he retired from eBay, decided to really devote the rest of his life to making a difference in the world and built three platforms to do that. One is Capricorn, which was one of the early impact investment arms. The second was Participant, which was uh, uh, to basically a platform to allow great artists to tell stories of social change and to drive narrative. And the third uh, is the Skoll Foundation, his philanthropic arm. And as a part of that, 11 years ago, he started uh, an organization called Ending Pandemics because he saw pandemics becoming a huge existential threat to the world. He participant ran the movie Contagion, which sadly predicted sort of where we were gonna be at. And in January, uh, through the Ending Pandemics organization, which we still fund, uh, he sort of heard about what was coming. He came to us and said, this is a moment uh, that we've all been fearing. Uh, he immediately, he basically said, we're gonna quadruple our funding and we're gonna run both the sprint and the marathon around the world to figure out where we can make a difference to bend the arc of this disease. Everything from uh, uh, both medical invention interventions to trying to support those uh, most marginalized communities who've been so uh, devastated by this virus and recognizing that we needed to do this in collaboration with others, that we couldn't do it on a standalone basis. And we've been doing that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our original vision was that we would start in Africa because the health systems were so weak. 
and we didn't expect what would happen in our own country in the US. Um, but in Africa, we've started working with leading philanthropists and with Raj and Rockefeller, and we've helped uh, both fund the Africa CDC, which is sort of overseeing a systemic response, working with governments, as well as the private sector entrepreneur, Strive Masawiya, who's built a supplies platform just so that Africa could get access to tests and PPE and oxygen supply. So very excited about that. But then we saw the virus spreading to South Asia. Um, we're working at Indus, Pac Indus Hospital in Pakistan, but also working with groups like Nudge, who created the Hope Fund to respond, bringing together philanthropists and uh, uh, and others uh, to to drive change. So we're in a, a sprint and a marathon, and uh, so excited to join with Raj and work he's pioneered in the U.S. around a, a compact with governors for testing that I'll let him talk about. But it's just this is a moment where philanthropists need to work with the private sector with government to help s catalyze and stimulate change, uh, and uh, just. Uh, groups like Nudge who are doing that in South Asia are making a huge difference. Thank you, that's so inspiring. Um, Raj, I'd love to hear from you as well. I know you're doing a lot of work in this area. Well, thank you, Natalie, and thank you for uh, having me and the Rockefeller Foundation be part of this conversation. It's great to be with uh, my friend Don Gibbs, for whom I have tremendous respect, and, and frankly, the Skoll uh, institutions plural, which have been, as Don points out, really early voices for uh, scanning the world, understanding things that could threaten to disrupt uh, human progress and human potential for hundreds of millions or billions of people at once, and then working to help the world prepare for that well before COVID-19. It was a tremendous act of foresight. And uh, and Jeff deserves a lot of credit for it, as, as does Don. I, I, uh, I'm so glad to be with a primarily Indian audience. Uh, I was in Bihar in November, and I had one of the most extraordinary visits uh, that I've had to India, and I've had many over the years, as you might imagine. Uh, but we were in rural Bihar, and we were uh, walking through villages, uh, talking to families, meeting uh, kids who were in school, and understood that one of the big things holding back the, many of the communities we visited was whether or not they had electricity. They would literally wait uh, and not know if the power was gonna go out or not. And that is, is such a common experience for those who've spent time in emerging markets and, and rural communities in particular. And through our Smart Power India program, the Rockefeller Foundation now uh, reaches more than 400,000 Indian families and helps them get access to renewable, reliable electricity. And it's been a 10 year endeavor and it has shown that India's poorest families will reliably pay for power so long as the power itself is reliable. And they'll then use that access to electricity to move themselves, their families and their whole community uh, up the ladder of opportunity out of poverty, creating jobs, supporting enterprise growth, and allowing girls to read at night uh, in, at home. And you know that kind of progress and potential was just so exciting because you could see hundreds of millions of people in India. We partnered with Tata Power to launch a billion dollar collaboration. You could actually see hundreds of millions of people moving up economically and moving up in terms of their access to dignity, to opportunity, and to a global economy. And COVID-19 has set that backwards. Uh, we, we now know on a global basis that maybe four to 500 million people will be pushed back under the $5 a day poverty line. That was a World Bank estimate from just uh, June. Almost every leader I speak to acknowledges that when you look across the next decade, it's likely to have real, uh, a real big step back in human progress for the world's 2 billion people who, who live you know, at the bottom of the economic ladder. And so the Rockefeller Foundation has committed itself to really uh, aggressively investing in a data-driven and effective response and uh, committing ourselves fully to supporting a global recovery that for once includes 
the voices and the presence and the needs and the urgency of the world's most vulnerable people. Uh, on the response, we've been very active, as Don notes, in supporting testing, contact tracing, the basic things you have to do to run a pandemic response, which are known to so many people around the world, uh, because we've been through so many of these pandemics, and yet it's very difficult. So the United States has sort of notoriously gotten this really, really wrong. Uh, we have a testing and contact tracing and public health messaging system. Those are the three core elements of responding to a pandemic that are absolutely off balance. Uh, our, it takes seven days to turn around a test in America that makes uh, taking people who are contagious out of the chain of transmission impossible. We don't seem to trust uh, public health officials enough to share data on contacts and it's hard to recall who you were with a week ago and our messaging from, uh, from the top down has been uneven and that's probably a very kind and politically uh, you know, uh, <laughs> mild uh, comment to make. So, so the reality is Rockefeller, the Skoll Foundation, we're holding hands with uh, 10 governors in America in a compact to help the governors get access to the kinds of rapid turnaround tests and improved approaches to contact tracing and public health messaging that will allow them to drive an effective response in their state, in part because the federal response in the United States has been so uneven and so challenged. And I'm thrilled that Jeff and Don uh, stepped up and are holding our hands to do this. They, they have all the credibility in the world given the focus they've had on pandemics for so long. And, uh, and we're gonna make some progress. We're, we're very focused on the antigen tests, which are new rapid turnaround tests, slightly less sensitive, but, but very effective. Uh, and and we, were, we were the first entity, I think, in America to launch a national testing plan and program, which we called the 1330 plan. We were stuck at about 600,000 uh, tests a week, and we said we need to get to 3 million and then 30 million over the course of the next five to six months in order to have an even response. Today, America, six months in, is not at 30 million, we're at 5 million. And that's part of why we're, we're failing so badly. Uh, I will say I'm very proud that we've been active in India as well on COVID and our, our Smart Power India programs and partners, some commercial, some nonprofit, have offered uh, energy and electricity vouchers to all their customers. They have taken care of uh, hundreds, if not thousands of their employees and avoided uh, COVID outbreaks in their businesses. They've maintained infrastructure and they've kept the power on through a crisis that would otherwise be debilitating. Uh, we've launched a major pandemics effort in India that, uh, ironically, India uh, quickly followed the, uh, the, the plan and created their own testing plan, I think, called the 1510 plan. And we have supported uh, Indian research institutes to create uh, rapid access PCR testing at scale for screening and clinical diagnostics across India. And that's something we're proud to have launched in Bangalore, but in, in a partnership with the Indian government. Uh, I guess the message I take away from all of this for your listeners is just, you know, there are times when uh, we all wanna be known for what we get done. There are times when we just wanna hold hands with others and actually deliver results. And in the crisis of this moment and in the urgency of it, I, I just hope more uh, partners will uh, do what Skoll has done and just said, look, we want to, we'll work with anyone, public sector, private sector, philanthropy, scientists, industry. Uh, let's, let's kind of reach across partisan and political divides and do the right thing to deliver results for the world's most vulnerable. Because we know that every time there's been a crisis and every time there's a global and local effort to support a recovery, it leaves out the most vulnerable people. That is true time and time again. And it's likely to be even more true this time without real concerted leadership and action. Thank you, that's uh, phenomenal and gives us hope, I think, both here in the US, but also um, everywhere where COVID is such a ravaging uh, problem um, and really increases the vulnerability, as you mentioned, Raj, for millions of people. I had another question for you, Dan, Don, sorry. I think you often speak about um, transformational social change at school. What do you think are the fundamental shifts that are required as we look beyond this pandemic um, towards the 2030 SDGs, for example, to, to really um, 
you know, to Raj's point, reimagine a future that works for all? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think first, first we have to take care of this pandemic. Uh, and this is another area Raj and I are working on. I, I think for transformation, if, if we can't figure out how to come together as a global community, coming out of this to be able to respond and build a long-term scaffolding that protects us from future pandemics, then there's sort of very little hope on other issues like climate and, and global poverty that are further uh, or less imminent and less, uh, I mean, you just can't imagine. And it just, it doesn't cost that much. Uh, there have been plans to do it. Raj can talk in detail because he wrote them when he was at USAID and has been on global commissions. There's an opportunity to bring the globe together, both not just the international institutions, but we fund something, Ending Pandemics funds local disease detection networks and Gideon, which we fund, helps create lab capacity in lower and middle income countries so that you can build this global scaffolding. That's such a huge opportunity to prove to the world, now that we've suffered through this, we don't have to do it again. And that, I believe, creates the scaffolding for solving a whole range of problems going forward. Um, at the same time, and this is uh, something we feel very strongly at Skoll, we have to continue to support those who've been working on the SDGs and driving change at the local level for years. And with the, the uh, economic crisis that's coming, continuing to support these locally led organizations who are driving change. And for us in India, Educate Girls and Pratham and Graham Vikas, Foundation for Ecological Security, Barefoot College and Selco are examples of prize winners that we've had that we are now doubling down in our efforts to make sure they can continue the, their work through this period. And they're all pivoting to figure out how to make a difference. So I think it's this combination of working at the local level, but also trying to figure out how you build that global scaffolding to support things. Thank you, that's great. I'd like to build on this, um, Raj, and turn to you this notion of, you know, really relying on building capacity in the communities uh, where, where uh, you work and, and also working with governments across the world. Um, I'd love to hear from you what, what have been some of your key learnings in terms of really engaging um, you know, local communities, local governments, um, and, and how does this dovetail with some of the large, large programs that you've been involved in? Well, well you know, I, I think some of the learnings are, are that um, first you have to reach out and find collaborators. And often that means uh, not always being right about everything <laughs> and listening to others and aligning with their strategies. I'll give you an example. When we started the effort around testing and contact tracing globally, um, I have been and remain very committed to antigen testing as well as, you know, I think in a few months, the world will, will shift to lateral uh, flow assay tests, which are like pregnancy or HIV tests that can be done safely at home with high reliability and security. Uh, but the Indian government uh, has prioritized PCR testing and efforts to make PCR testing, you know, uh, broad, ubiquitous and fast because of its higher sensitivity. And to some extent, that's a more difficult scientific path uh, than I was initially proposing. But we are uh, less interested, frankly, in being, you know, uh, technically on one side or another and more interested in holding hands with the government and, and ensuring that private companies, research institutes, government and philanthropy come together to drive a real testing strategy for India. So this is the one we're getting behind and, and now we're seeing this very rapid progress uh, with all the Indian research institutes creating really important breakthroughs on PCR testing and high throughput uh, evaluation in that context. So. You know, the, the first thing is just being open to genuine collaboration um, and in a manner where it doesn't have to be your idea. It's, it's really what's best for uh, who's in charge and how to help them be successful. 
I think the second thing is to be very clear about the goal. Uh, again, I think when we did the one three thirty plan or India did the one five ten plan or, you know, in any of these examples, clarity around what you're trying to achieve, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, Immunize Every Child in the World, uh, Global Fund for AIDS to be in Malaria, you know, it's obvious what the goals are. That sort of clarity around the goal is exceptionally important. And then we have to stick with it for 10, 15, 20 years, because that's what it has proven to take to deliver the kind of outcomes and results. And by the way, for, for people like uh, Bill Gates or Jeff Skoll or Nanda Nilakani or, or others who built companies from, from scratch, you know, staying focused for 20 years is how you get it done, right? It's not, no, not, not one of those folks succeeded in the first 18 months. So I, do, I, think, I think that sticking with it against a goal is another big lesson. And then I'd say a final, a final lesson is really genuinely being um, adaptable. Like I, I've been surprised by, not surprised, I've expected this, but you know, I, I'm, I'm pleased that major institutions we've all been a part of crafting uh, whether on pandemics uh, prediction or epidemiological surveillance or vaccine production and manufacturing in India, Serum Institute of India is a good example, have been able to pivot, you know, to COVID-19 in a, with a kind of open mind. And, you, you know, other people can comment on this history, but I think had it not been for the 20 year collaboration around childhood immunization, I'm not sure the Indian vaccine industry would have the capacity it now has to shift that capacity to the massive scale up of potential uh, vaccines for, for the world to, to utilize and particularly for India and emerging economies with very large vulnerable populations. So I, I just think that ability to be adaptive is, is really important uh, and really critical. So we're, we're trying to, what we've learned, for example, in our power work in India, is that we initially started by, I think, you know, distributing uh, flashlights, solar powered flashlights and cubes and things that, uh, you know, really did improve the quality of life in some small settings. But we quickly learned that what will both drive business success and what people really want is to get uh, enough reliable power that they can use it for productive commercial use. And whether that is hulling rice or, uh, or, you know, actually powering a business that's creating construction jobs for four or five, six other people. Uh, it's much, much, much more energy intensive than solar powered flashlights and, and the kinds of things that got more attention maybe 10 years ago. So being able to adapt, listen and learn based on data and evidence is, is the other kind of lesson learned for me. That's great. And I think, you know, those are lessons that we could apply at the individual level too. I think, you know, being open to hear what others say, um, being focused on the goal and being adaptable. Um, I think those are great um, tenets to live your life by as well as sort of run an organization by. So thank you. It's, that's probably harder to do, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's pretty much all hard to do. But yeah, this is, this is wonderful. Um, I, I wanted to sort of close out um, by asking you both, I feel like we're in a time where we need a, some optimism and I, I'd love to ask you really what inspires you most today as we are waging war with a pandemic, looking at a deep economic crisis heading our way in the next coming years. What, what um, Don, maybe I'll start with you. What inspires you most today? Uh, it's a great question. and. Uh, you know, I'll start with the frontline workers who are uh, around the world uh, putting themselves at risk to, um, to save other people's lives, often underpaid, uh, whether they're community health workers or uh, um, doctors or nurses. It's truly uh, remarkable to see the selflessness, the coming together and then you know we're also seeing and it's i never thought i'd see as much progress as we've seen in the u.s in the past since the george floyd moment of people recognizing that we have to change some of these structures and systems and the battle still has a long way to go but even the fact that for those of you who followed uh NASCAR in the United States, they've re removed the Confederate flag. You know, 
people would have bet against that six months ago. So and it shows the power of people coming together and recognizing these systemic inequities. We cannot build the type of society that anyone can be proud of if we don't address them. And I think it, you know, it's led by young people, it's led by the most marginalized, but all of us joining in, in that fight. And it, it'll give the energy that will move politicians and philanthropy has its role to play, but I'm incredibly inspired by that. Raj, what, what inspires you? Well, I, you know, what Don just described is, uh, is, is a awakening or a reawakening of our better values. And I think we see those better values in the, you know, if you're in the United States, in the essential workers who deliver food and medicines to your home, you see it in teachers being willing to go into a classroom with 10 or 12 kids and teach. You see it in uh, first responders who've had the courage and some have lost their lives. Uh, to be on the front lines of COVID response. And I, I have three uh, young kids, Don has kids. Uh, I, think, I think we see in those kids, people looking up to that kind of courage and those types of values in a way that's exciting for me to see. Uh, we also still look up to our sports stars, <laughs> which is great. Uh, but it's nice to see, you know, it's nice to see doctors and nurses and teachers and other essential workers being recognized for the heroes that they are and, and continue to be. Uh, and so the values and the reawakening of those common values is something I'm very optimistic about. And then the other piece of it is the sheer, you know, remarkable progress of technology. I think whether you look at digitization or biotechnology, information technology, the technological frontier is moving so fast uh, that we can envision batteries that can store power uh, and be durable and cheap in rural Bihar so that a mini grid of, you know, a set of solar panels that 10 years ago would have been somewhat useless in that setting today tied to smart meters and artificial intelligence and new battery chemistries can, can effectively power a village of five, 10,000 people and change their lives dramatically. Ironically, we've done that. Uh, but but Skoll has also, through Capricorn, a, a group Don mentioned, all, also invested in those types of technologies and brought them to the to the forefront. So the 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 movements on testing technology, on vaccines, even on some therapeutics, are moving faster than people would have expected because I think of the optimism and the energy that exists in the innovation sectors. Uh, so those things give me a lot of hope. And and one one final thing about where values and technology come together is in the spirit of just entrepreneurship. And uh, we've been really excited to support an effort called the uh, mass, a movement for mass entrepreneurship uh, called GAME in India. And you see these, you know, Indian CEOs, big companies get together with colleges and universities and training programs, and then with local communities and you, you just get to see how they're able to unlock the capacity of people to be entrepreneurial and move themselves up. All of that is the combination of values and technology and an understanding that we're a stronger society if everyone's included. And uh, I just hope that those uh, characteristics that make me so optimistic about this moment persist over the next 18 to 24 months as the world begins to shape a recovery from COVID-19 because those are the values that are gonna be most needed to succeed. And if I can just add one thing to what Raj just said, because I couldn't agree more. Um, this is a moment like none of us are ever likely to have in our lifetimes again, where these all these systems that we've been talking about will be reshaped and we all need to engage in the fight to reshape them, to capture it and the values that protect, that recognize the dignity of all people and, and bring those to the forefront. Well, I just wanna thank you both so much. I definitely am feeling better than when we started this chat. And so I want to express gratitude to both of you and also to everybody, um, that works in collaboration uh, across uh, sectors and across organizations uh, really to bring meaningful social change uh, to people 
uh, who are vulnerable uh, everywhere in the world today. So gratitude to both of you, and thank you also to Nudge uh, for hosting this incredible uh, fireside chat. Thank you.